right. but it's because I'm thinking about the song and I don't want to mess it up. But he would get on the intercom and go, give me your sexy voice. So, <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local music scene and the people that make it, including me and this guy. My guest today has traveled from Martha's Vineyard all the way to Nashville, and on the way he's picked up a couple of Grammy nominations, I'm sorry, Grammy recommendations. Recommendations. Um, had, his, had his original music played in Europe and across the U.S. He has been a show host of a show called Russ and Friends, had a lead role in A Songwriter's Life, which is a reality TV show about songwriter. A uh, good friend of uh, Cameron West. Who's going to be coming on the show? Camden? Camden. Camden, sorry. Camden West, who's going to be coming on the show. Um, and yeah, met him at a House of Ours Homegrown Songwriter Showcase at the Artisan before it changed over to the Strat. Um, that's awesome. Sundays, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I've got a live stream on the channel if you want to check it out. Uh, or if you're in the neighborhood, swing on by. There's a lot of talent. Amazing amount of talent. Um, please welcome to the show. Lost Lacasse. Ah, thank you, Josh. Say hi, folks. Hi, folks. <laughs> now, it is Lacasse, not Lacasse. It's Lacasse. It is Lacasse. Good, good, good. I got it right. Um, first of all, welcome to the show. Ah. Clunk. Yes. Clunk. <laughs> so, as I said, I met Russ at the, um, the Artisan at the Homegrown Songwriter Showcase, mm -hmm. and he didn't play then. No. Nope. You were just in town. He, he lives in Arizona. <clears throat> And uh, you're in town, and you ran into Camden, who you knew from yes, Nashville, which, yes. is, which is a small world. It was awesome. I I walked in the venue. I was scheduled for the night that we played at our house. Ah, yes, our house. But we were supposed to play at the Artisan. Mm -hmm. And I like to get a feel for a venue sure. before I play. Same. So I came up unannounced, mm -hmm. and I watched... Hal Savar set up. <laughs> I mean, I just watched him set mm -hmm. up. I, I didn't even offer to help. I probably should have. But uh, his setup's pretty pretty straightforward. Yeah. Like one of the nice things for him at the, at the Strat was that he didn't have to bring any of his gear. No. There's a stage. There's a back line. Well, I mean, there's a drum set mm -hmm. with a with a, a drum shield, yeah. and it worked. The drum, it was still loud in there, but yeah, yeah. So uh, I was I was happy for him. Because I've seen him lug his stuff in, yeah. Yes, yeah, so on the wagon. Yeah. And uh, then and when he was setting up and the performers were getting their guitars tuned and getting ready to do their thing, mm -hmm. I went and introduced myself and said, hey, I'm Russ Lacasse. I'm going to perform in a couple of weeks. I just thought I'd come up and get a feel for the venue. And he was thrilled. And I turned around to sit in the audience, and up comes a gentleman that I knew. And I went, wow, Camden. And we chatted for, for quite a bit there. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in Nashville, we knew each other. He yeah. played on my show, Russ and Friends. In fact, he was a recipient of my yearly award. I, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I need yearly awards, but I, how do I, what, what's the award for? The award was, I kept it in my head as I did the show, because my show back in Nashville was recorded through the soundboard, mm -hmm. and it was also Facebook Live, and all those Facebook Lives are still on on Facebook right now. Even though and, Facebook hates live music. Yeah, <laughs> and because they'll kick you out if something's got an ISRC. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, then you'd have to report it and say, hey, this was the artist doing their own song. Yes, it's been a release song, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, YouTube, you don't know anything about that, do you? <laughs> I, I get so many copyright claims when the artist is on the channel yes. performing their own music. And, yes. I, and it bugs the crap out of me. I'm like, why, YouTube? Mm -hmm. what? The live stream. Yes. Every live stream so far. Because it's been in, in a venue where there's been some sort of like music. House music in the background. Copyright. Yes. Copyright claim. You yep. can't even tell what the song is. Yes. And yet somehow there's copyright claim in a casino. I'm like, now you're just being ridiculous. Yep. I went through that just about every week. Yeah. Well, that's all right. And, and uh, I'll worry about it more when, when, if I'm, you know, whenever yeah. I get to monetization. Yeah. What I did is I, I 
had a date book mm -hmm. and had the performers each week. I'd have anywhere between three and eight performers every week on my show. Mm -hmm. And I would keep track of their style, their rapport with the audience. Um, if the re audience responded to them mm -hmm. and reports that I got afterwards from the, the venue owners, the sound engineers. Um, wow. I mean, David from Lady Antebellum was at one of my shows one night and I was doing a song and he was sitting outside the venue and he turned around, he rapped on the window on like this. He liked the song and I'm like, by the time the show ended, he had, he had been gone. He is gone. Right. But, uh, don't say, Hey, you want that song? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, what I did is I, I took mental notes and physical notes in the book about people's performances, writing styles, content, especially right. because you don't want that repetitive content. You don't want someone singing about the tailgate dropping on the truck and sitting, right. you know, and getting drunk. You're like, did I hear this song already? Yeah. yeah. And you, you, I didn't vote for them. I voted for people that wrote a little bit different. And Camden and, definitely does. And yeah. Camden did. And so he was one of the, uh, I think I picked eight per year. The third year I didn't do it because it was cut short. Mm -hmm. um, but the first two years I did and they're, they're up there on Facebook. You can find out who the recipients are. And, and a lot of them have great music careers right now. Awesome. Uh, by the way, happy birthday. Oh, <laughs> At time you. of recording, this birthday is in a few days, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm the 13th. Way to get older. Yes. You're what, 39? Oh, uh, and a couple times, yeah. Yes. And not a couple times. I like to say, I'm, <laughs> Just I'm, a couple, couple years older. Uh, than I'm 49, so I'll be, so I'm 59, and I'll be 59 until I'm 69. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you're a gemologist, is that right? I am a gemologist, yes. Okay. In Arizona, I know yes. there's a lot of mines and there's a lot of, you know, um, strata and things to, to do that, but it, is that, that, that's more geology than gemology, right? Yes, geology is the study of the composition of, of the of the right. rocks. And, and gemology okay. is the little stones. The shiny stuff. stuff. The little shiny stuff, yes. Okay, how'd you get into that? Oh, man. Well, I lived in Maine. Mm -hmm. I was a recreational miner my whole life. And when, when you say miner, you mean actually pickaxe or panning? Pickaxe. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hard rock mining wow. to what they call alluvial mining, which is in the washes, where right. stuff washes down, but there's still some big rocks. I started, um, my first thing was sapphire. Ah, uh, nice. Love sapphire. Any sapphires or just any sapphire? Any sapphire. I mean, I, and I would go to Montana mm -hmm. to mine sapphires at a couple mines there. And, uh, that was a lot of fun. And it, Finding sapphires, you find garnet. Finding garnet, you find. You can see my Boston accent come out. Garnet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you you find other stones like spinel, uh, occasionally a diamond. Right. So, it got me hooked. I was a mechanical engineer back in Maine. Ah. I designed a lot of equipment, and I worked with a lot of miners. I worked with miners, fishermen, and the logging and lumber industry, and the governments kind of shut down portions of the industry, mm -hmm. the fishing industry. They limit them because overfishing or, sure. or pollution or whatever. Uh, the loggers, you know, taking too many logs. Uh, you know, it's all for the benefit. Sustainability. Yeah, it's just, yeah. And by doing that, it puts a lot of people out of business. When that happens, it changes your customer base. And the only thing it didn't change was the, the mining because most of the miners that I worked with were private miners. They owned their own property and they mined on their property. And it was ha -ha. pegmatite mining. And pegmatite is like a granite muscovite or a lot of people call it. Uh, I can't think of it right now. Oh. It's so many words going through my head, yeah. but, but it was, it, it was that. And it, and there would be pockets. In not, not veins, but pockets. 
little pockets in the veins. So oh, okay. the, like, like the pegmatite would always go out on an angle, the way the volcano would shoot mm -hmm. the molten rock up. And it's like decayed granite kind of thing. And uh, mica was the word I'm looking for. Oh, okay. I'll that. <laughs> so mica is like a rock you can peel. It's, it's pretty cool. And uh, that would come through the ground on an angle, and they would drill down and hit that, and occasionally... As they're drilling, their drill would drop down and saying, whoa, there's a pocket in that pegmatite. And then they would have to blast mm -hmm. and clear the rubble. And when they did, they would find a pocket. And it's just like a geode. So the geode sure. is the pegmatite. And when they drill, the pocket is the inside of that geode. And they would find crystal ones. So nice. all sorts. Um, we just helped, uh, a few weekends ago, we helped somebody move from... Basically, the Phoenix area mm -hmm. to Eloy. Familiar with Eloy? Yes. Very small town, Eloy. In like 45 minutes to get to their house from the freeway. Wow. Yeah, like when you leave the freeway, you left civilization and you're just driving <laughs> and there's signs like, you know, careful, the flooding and all flooding, that. Yes. Uh, but um, she had, our, our friend, a married couple, she had so many freaking crystals just <laughs> giant crystals and geodes and for whatever reason she collects like china hutches there was a china hutch taller than me and weighed like three times as much one piece thank you sherry um <laughs> she knows she knows about it yeah but uh no but it i remember think looking at him going like this isn't just geodes you find Sorry, at, like the mall something went wrong shut up alexa anyway uh i these weren't just like geodes you could pick up at the mall or, or you know, uh, um, at an at a arts and crafts fair or something in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Th these were, I don't know where she got them, but there were some well, serious crystals. Every year, there's a huge gem show in Tucson. That. And it lasts about a month, and Eloy is, what, 60, yeah. 60 miles probably from Tucson. About that. And it lasts a month long. And you will never see every single vendor wow. that is there. Because um, I lived in Tucson for a couple of seasons, and I never saw it all. I'll have, to, I'll have to tell her about that and see if, yep. you know, have you ever been there? And if not, you should go. Oh, yeah. Um, speaking of Bassin, talk me through, how'd you go from Massachusetts, from Martha's Vineyard, to Nashville, to Santa Claus, Arizona? Ah, when I had my company in Maine, oh. and this is the uh, start the, um, the engineering yeah. company uh, and a machine shop, and I designed a lot of nice equipment. Uh, and I used to take these trips to go mining. Mm -hmm. And the first place I bought a piece of property was in Montana, and it was just a gorgeous piece of property. Big sky country. Yes. And I bought an RV, a oh. fifth wheel. As you do. Yes. In Montana. Yeah. And then I got to the point in my company that I was the janitor to the president. <laughs> and because I terminated the employment of a couple of people that worked for me. And one that really did an outstanding job for me uh, left on his own. And he, he didn't want to learn anymore. Uh, yeah. So he wanted the simple life. So he became a janitor for, for a trucking company. And he loved it. I still believe it. I think he's still doing it. So anyway, um, I looked at my wife at the time and said, I'm done. <laughs> and she went, well, go in the house and relax then. I still got some work out here to do. And I'm like, no, 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 you, you misunderstand me. I'm done. Yeah. And she's like, done what? And I had already taken all the gemology classes right. and courses. You and, leveled up. And I had already had my gemology certificate. So I'm like, maybe I should just make jewelry. <laughs> so right on. So, uh, what did you do after that? Snow burning. We uh, snowbirded. Uh, we stayed in Tucson the first season. Mm -hmm. 
when it got too warm up there, we wandered on up to Montana to our property. Must be nice. But on the way, wandering up, we came over the dam with the RV, which yeah. was spooky back then. Yeah, that, you were literally driving over the dam. Yes, driving like over now. the dam. And uh, all the way up, we kept seeing for sale signs for property. $50 <laughs> down, $50 a month. And if you head south of Kingman on I-40 and then hit 93 like you're going to Phoenix, mm -hmm. there is an awesome amount of gemological locations. And you could find everything from geodes to Apache Tears, Garnet, oh man, gold. Huh. I believe there's some amethyst. And she she actually uh, uh, mined with you. Yes. Yeah. She was my digger. <laughs> Gem digger, not a gold and, digger. Uh, yeah. She has since uh, passed away. Uh, we had gotten divorced. But she uh. she has passed away. Uh, I got word last summer or yeah I believe it was last summer well, I'm sorry to you know yeah. hear that uh, yeah, but I have I'm, a question for you though as a gemologist did you ever like make her ring or, or all the time all the time all the time but but you were already married when you started hunting. yes okay so yes there, there was no engagement ring made oh no 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 okay no no because that's uh, my mind to be like, yeah. but what happened one time when we went to Montana we went over into Idaho to an a garnet area. Okay. It was in up near Moscow, Idaho. It was it's way up there. I kind of love that name. <laughs> Almost, yeah. I mean, that, that's better than Santa Claus, Arizona, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. like, I can't. I just bet you Moscow, Idaho has got to be the <laughs> most anti-communist place <laughs> ever. I think so. I think Idaho is. And uh, we went to this garnet recreational area and we uncovered the second largest hexahedral which is 12 size yes it is garnet second largest Just ever naturally found naturally hexahedral oh yeah natural Not a, oh wow it was it had chips in it but right it was oh bigger than a golf ball smaller than a tennis ball if you don't mind me asking at the time what was the worth of that we had asked, okay. and this came up in the divorce. <laughs> ah, ah. How do you split it's, that? It's like, um, they told us that it was priceless. Come on. I mean, because no, if you're going to at all, you know, cut it and, and yeah. you know, refacet mm -hmm. it and all that stuff, there's got to be a price yeah, it's got to be, but whatever it is, How, and, and when it came up in the divorce, the, the, the judge, which was a female judge, and she was very fair, and, and she looked at me and she said, how would you value that garnet? Yeah. And I said, I would value it at what someone is willing to pay for it. That's the fair only enough. way. You, you can't yeah. actually put a price on that. And yet, I mean, eventually someone would. Someone would. I, I don't, she had... She had it with her. Okay. So I have no idea where that gun went. But, gotcha. But uh, we did that for a couple of years, and then eventually one of those signs, fifty dollars down, fifty dollars yeah. a month, caught our eye, and we said, you know, instead of paying an RV park to stay and then go back to Maine and in, in oh, the yeah. summer and then really bust your butt all summer long and do a year's worth of work, right? And Get a year's kind worth of financial. Cost in time. Well, why don't we just buy the piece of property and then we have it? And right. and I still have that piece of property today. Nice. And this is in uh, Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Yeah. Cool. Yep. And a lot of people are like, what's Santa Claus, Arizona? Santa Claus, Arizona was a, a small village and it was an amusement park uh -huh. at one time. I've seen pictures actually. Yes. They they do they did Christmas big. Yes. At least they tried all year round. All have year you, round. Have you ever been to Santa's Village in uh, California? No. Up in Crestline, uh, I lived in Crestline in very early uh, age, and Santa's Village was this like year round. I think no no I think it was only open for like the winter months to 
maybe early spring. Mm-hmm. But it was basically a small little theme park. It had they. I remember there was a, a kind of a monorail ride. Uh, and you're a kid, you're a little mm-hmm. kid, and you're just like, this is awesome, man. And, and you're just surrounded by trees. It's, wow. it's like, boom, you planted in the middle of the forest. But it, it was basically what Santa Claus, Arizona wanted to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it was properly in the mountains and there was snow and, yeah, and, yeah everything. So, yeah. Uh, cool. Because back east, there's also one. Uh, That's right. Yeah, there's in New Hampshire. And then you have... You betcha. In, <laughs> in New York, across Lake Champlain. There was the North Pole, North Pole, New York, right? And they had a, a Santa's Village type thing there too, which right. is pretty cool. Um, real quick before we move on, my dog wants out apparently. Joys of filming at home, so uh, we're gonna take a uh, not a booze break, but drink break. Uh huh. We're back! Yay! Now then, we're gonna move on from gemology because okay. this is about yeah. music. So. Yes. I want to talk about uh, earliest musical influence. Okay. Now, your musical style, just listening to you perform, got a little bit of that laconic kind of Willie nelson uh, uh, uh Who else am I thinking of? Um, I, the review that posts tomorrow about the, the showcase, um, I, I talked about your performance, and I, I had it down, and I said things, and I can't remember them now, but who was your earliest musical influence? Like, what was the first song or performer or genre or whatever that you said I want to do that and when and when did you come to it well I never did that as far as um wanting to do it Mm -hmm. but I love listening okay ever since I was little and the Beatles of course and then the other Apple band would be Badfinger I just absolutely love Badfinger See, I don't hear any of either of those no. bands. <laughs> Harry Nelson. Uh, 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 Harry, uh, remind me, what, what's the song? It's, it's, he did the song "Without You." It's kind of piano esque. Okay, there it is, piano. But Thank you. I was thinking guitar. The guys in Badfinger mm-hmm. wrote that song. Really? Yes. Yes. Uh, Today I learned. Pete Ham and Tom Evans wrote "Without You," and then I guess Mariah Carey, I think, did it, or one of the female. Big female stars did I that song. I can't remember, but I, it's yeah. ringing a bell. But yeah. anyway. There was a few. So, and... Oh, go ahead. Carl Bonoff. Oh. You see, just about everybody out there is going, This who? is why I love doing this show, though, is because what? I ask that question, and then when I'm editing later, I'm making little notes yeah. about who to check out. Carl Bonoff, if you look up Carl Bonoff, she started when she was like 15 or 16 years old in... L.A. at the Troubadour and hanging out with those people and skipping school and such. And she wrote some amazing songs. And Falling Star was when I was a kid. It was it? It just hit me. Gotcha. Uh, it's a love song. And then she wrote other songs. Winona cut some. Uh, I believe. Bonnie Ray, Linda Ronstadt cut a song of hers. So is that kind of where so, the country influences started coming from? Kind of, but there's a bigger one. Okay. Kent Lavoy. I honestly, rec- I recognize that name, but I can't remember why. His name is Lobo. See, I grew up listening to country and western. Yeah. Uh, in in the high desert, actually. Oh. Um, and it, but like Crystal Gale. Yeah. And, and Kenny Rogers yeah. and, and all that. And it's there, but I can't yeah. remember a single song or anything. Lobo, Lobo. Lobo. Was there a, a what, what was the song that? Me and You and a Dog Named Boo? There it is. It's p- very picturesque writing. And in Nashville, uh, a lot of people there called me, you know, the three minute movie guy. Why? Because. I write that if you close your eyes, okay. you will. It was a en- compliment. Yeah, <laughs> you, like... will, you will envision the song. Mm-hmm. You can you can actually put yourself yep. in my music. I have personally, over the years as a songwriter, uh, tried to tell a story. And I've always hated like the songs where it fades out, repeating the same thing over and over and over and over and over because I got lazy yeah. or you know whatever. Yeah. 
Um, I've tried, and, and I actually recognize that in you, that your songwriting, you're trying to tell a story and not just trying to rhyme or, or yes. do something, you know, yeah. uh, uh, so, yeah. yeah. So I went from snowbirding okay. back east, uh, moved out here, moved on to the property in Arizona that I presently live in, live on, mm -hmm. and then I got divorced. Dum, dum, dum. Yeah. Then I found another lady who I thought was just absolutely wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, much younger than me. She had three children, three young children, which I adored. Um, I thought we had a great life. We were together like eight years, and then something clicked somewhere between us, and she decided it wasn't for her, so she moved into uh, Kingman, Arizona, and uh, and I lost track of her. But, oh. but uh, I was out there all by myself in the middle of the desert, and then I said, well, I think I'm going to get a guitar. I, when I, yeah, I had one, and I I didn't play it. I, I knew some basic chords, mm -hmm. but I knew nothing about music theory. I didn't know much. All I knew is I liked music that I liked. Sure. Stuff on the radio I wasn't kind of liking because it was this is the what? same song. This is what decade? <laughs> this is the 90s? Or? Yeah. Uh, 2000. 2010. So. Yeah. Hey. And, and it was just repetitive. Repetitive. Yeah. Tailgates. Wind blowing in the hair. Oh, you mean my windows down. Right now. And it was like so I put in my old CDs, I mean, mm -hmm. and, and, and then finally I said, well, I'm going to teach myself how to play this guitar. Right. So I started, and believe it or not, there was this little cottontail rabbit, which was the runt of the litter. Oh. And when my lady moved away with her kids, uh, this rabbit, which we had saved because it was stuck in our utility shed mm -hmm. and uh, with its two siblings, and we let them all go because Mama never came back to take care of them. Oh. Well, this little rabbit would always come around, and I would feed it raisins, carrots, oh. grapes, and now it whatever. To you, yeah. So every every time I'd pull my car in the driveway, and I had this neon green car, mm -hmm. must have thought it was lettuce or something because <laughs> I'd pull in, and that rabbit's right there, sitting right at the steps of my RV. Oh. Just waiting for me, and uh, I would feed it, and um, I would stop picking and playing on the guitar, and I only had like four, what I call songs, which I haven't recorded any of these four, but um, when I got to this one particular song, it didn't matter if it was the first song, the second, the third, or the fourth, wherever I played it, that rabbit would take off. I just didn't like it. Just didn't like it. And I don't know why. But uh, I got together with some family members back east. And they said, hey, why don't you come back east and spend some time with your family? And so I did. Nice. And I said, well, you know, I got these four songs. I'm going to submit them to an online... Review? Uh, or? Yeah, kind of a review, but it was a contest. Okay. And... The reviews came back, and, and they basically told me, you need to learn a little bit more about structure. You need to have some... The stuff that's hard to hear. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but they went, the content and the visualization and the... They used the word furniture in it. Oh, I'm my. Like, what furniture? The, you know, the, I didn't mention the, chairs. The, the, the furniture is the hardest part about si yeah. uh, songwriting. The lipstick and makeup, yeah. you know, that's... That's fine, but the furniture, that, that the bones yes. of, the, of the house, if you will, yep. it's so much harder to figure out, how do I write a song that has yes. body as opposed to just... Yeah, but they told me it had that, yeah. and I needed to learn a little bit more about songwriting. So I started taking some music theory lessons ah. from a guitarist. His name is Peter Keller, and he's on my Instagram. And... Uh, <laughs> He taught, me, he, ta he taught me quite a bit about um, music theory. And he's a younger man. I mean, he, he's 
still in his 20s, I believe, or 30s. And uh, he was super. And then I'm like, I need to progress. I need to do stuff. So I started looking online and I, I saw Nashville Songwriters Association. I said, well, I want to see what that's all about. So I emailed them. They said, hey, we have a, we have a, a, a division or a, a group that meets in Connecticut. How far are you from that? And I said, well, I'm about 65, 70 miles, but I'll go visit them. So I did, and I brought a couple of the songs that I had written, and they were telling me the same thing. Mm -hmm. Hi, that chord doesn't go with this. You need it to go here. You know, uh, lyrically, you got it, but it's more poetic than lyrics. Uh, so there was a lot of things. And then he had, a couple of them went, hey, we're going to Nashville next week or a couple weeks from then, and uh, we're going to go to what they call summer camp. And it's all hit writers, oh, nice. and they teach you, and they critique you. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, I'd like to go. So I went. Got the time off from work and went. Um, and met a lot of hit writers. I'm not going to drop all their names, but uh, I met a lot of them, became friends, and still friends with them. And then I found out, hey, there's another songwriter in an event on Martha's Vineyard. Which is conveniently where I live. It's, it's like, I, I drive to the dock, I drive my car on the ferry, ferry us over to the island, and there it was. Right. So I went, and one of these hit writers was an instructor at the Nashville event, mm -hmm. and he was an instructor on Martha's Vineyard. And I submitted a new song that no one heard, and it was called Nine Millionth Time. And when these three hit writers heard that song, I thought they were in cahoots with each other, that they were um, conspiring to embarrass me or something. And it wasn't true. They, they said, man, this song is a, a million dollar song, not saying you're going to earn a million dollars, but... Um, the song could earn a million dollars if you find the right artist to do the song. Um, because they, they, it was all visual. Right on. And um, at the end, one of the songwriters said, I know that you did the demo. Not very good. <laughs> she says, but I'm the dean of students at Berkeley and music school right right and i can probably get you someone to do that because i'm in charge of seven thousand rock stars <laughs> so i'm like okay so we traded information and again she's a number one hit songwriter we're still friends and she did she found one of her former students to do the demo for the song and i started pitching it and it was getting um taken by publishers for sec what we call second listens. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, it just, well, back in Moffat's Vineyard, uh, the other songwriter uh, lives in San Francisco, which I'm still, <laughs> I am friends with all of them. I'm just, like, thrilled. Mm -hmm. But uh, him and I became good friends, and we contact each other back and forth and him and the third one got together and then the third one came to me and said you know you really need to move to Nashville and he had my lyric sheet he says you wrote that you didn't have a co-writer but what I think be beneficial to you is to go to Nashville get in with the songwriting community mm -hmm. and grow with your peers and I looked at him and went a hell of a lot older than all them peers <laughs> and he went you're pushing paper nobody knows who you are what you know yeah. what your age is and what you look not like. to mention you have life experience they don't have yeah there's a certainness that um when you perform you can hear like you've lived some of this stuff oh i lived every one of my songs yeah same and same with me uh with one exception i wrote a song about adultery <laughs> i had a certain woman. this is gonna sound even worse i had a certain woman in mind to sing with me about it um, no, 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 sorry, I wrote a different song for her, 
But uh, I wrote the song about adultery just because I want. I was like, I want to make a sexy song. Uh, I want to make a song that just, you know, is just dripping with the song that would make my teenage daughter uncomfortable. <laughs> that, would, that her dad wrote it, and uh, and and I, I, I wrote it. It's uh, called Responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, and you can get it on my second CD. Link down there anyway. Um, but every time I, I play it, I'm always feeling slight. I'm always. I always have to preface it with like, this is not autobiographical. <laughs> So, yeah, but almost everything I do mm -hmm. is autobiographical. Some things are metaphorical. Right. Um, There's only so much you can write about yeah. that, that without repeating yourself, like you say. So, the song that I did at Art House, uh, Absolute Bloody Merry Morning, is your relationship is dissolving, but it's because of the bottle. Absolute well, bloody. <laughs> it, it, it could it could be anything. It could be any bad habit that you have, or right. or any incompatibility. Incombat mm. <laughs> Irreconcilable. Yeah. So whatever that is, whatever that bottle is, is what ruined the relationship. But in that song, you're not doing a damn thing about it. You're gonna let it go. But you know that there's gonna be an amount of pain, hurt, guilt everything come to it and that's your absolute bloody merry morning mm -hmm. and amaretto sour afternoon so which is a great line yeah. and reminds me of uh amarillo by morton yeah <laughs> uh anyway i wanted to ask um how long have you been just doing or performing out in front of people performing out um <sighs> just in a ballpark number 20 okay so you've done 16, some shows probably you've done some shows yeah i thought you were gonna say 20 years because, because i had my own show right. and i performed on it almost <laughs> every week not every week because i didn't want the like i said it was recorded right and then broadcast to 54 countries around the world and if they hear me every week they may say oh i heard that show last week and turn it off That's so i didn't want to be on it every single week. Right. So the reason I ask is, what is your favorite show memory? Some memory, whether good, bad, weirdness, somebody went to jail, whatever. Some memory that you're just like, this one time, do you have a show memory like that of you performing somewhere? Yeah, I have a couple. Bring it. One is, I was at Belcourt Taps, where the show was uh, videoed and recorded and broadcast to the world. Mm -hmm. I was actually on stage with my lead guitarist who performed with everybody. I mean, he'd just pick along with anybody. He did not, never heard your stuff. He could just pick with you. And he would always be to the far left of the stage, viewing the stage. Then I had this duo in between us and then me. And I, I did this song called Tender. Okay. I believe I did that at our house also and um i had my phone on this fireplace mantle which was behind us oh no and when this duo was performing my phone's going off like, you didn't turn your ringer off no i'm like what it was a lady from germany yeah and i'm like what and this is before so, scam scam like <laughs> so i'm like <laughs> Wow, that's pretty cool. And then a big smile on my face. Well, after the duo was done, because they would do two to my one, because there was two of them, mm -hmm. um, it would be my turn. I would say, you people are not going to believe this. And the video, I believe, is still up on Facebook. I turned the phone around. And I go, this lady from Germany owns a radio station, and she wants a copy of my song, Tender. Well, we didn't have a recorded version of Tender. I never, I had never been Oops. in a studio yet. <laughs> and I performed for like two, three years out there. And finally, um, I went, cool, all right. Well, my sound guy was an excellent sound engineer. He came up to me and he said, I'll just take the stems home on thumb drive and then I'll... Oh, so he was recording the, the whole show anyway? Yeah, it was recorded for the radio. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So we had stems. We, we had oh, yeah. f four DI boxes, four microphones mm -hmm. on every show. 
uh, whether they were used or not. He would, could ship individual ones off. And uh, so he had all the stems. And then my show ended, and then the next round came up. Well, I mingle with the crowd. Sure. And then the owner come running up to him. She goes, man, the, the round after this one, they just canceled. I have nobody to take the stage. Can you find somebody? Because she knew I knew everybody in town. I'm like, yeah, yeah. So I went and asked that duo if they wanted to play again. Mm -hmm. And I asked my guitarist, Randy, if he wanted to play again. And I, of course, I did. Because this is my the, show. the crowd would change, would swap out. Oh, we were right near right. Vanderbilt, right near the hospital, right near the university. So the the doctors and nurses would leave and then... The younger, the, the college people would come in, you know? So uh, we, we got to play Tender again. Mm -hmm. And then what had happened was my sound engineer now had the song done two times in the same night by the same people, but the duo had learned the song no way. from listening to it. So Josh Lampkin was playing bass patterns on his guitar while Randy was playing lead guitar and Nailani so you, you, Rothrock, you basically had a a band <laughs> <laughs> and then Nailani sang backing vocals. Well my sound engineer a couple weeks later he came back and said, Here, send this to Germany and I did and they played it and they loved it and it played in Luxembourg and I Germany. remember new David Hasselhoff. Yeah, yes. <laughs> And then the second one was, I got to play with members of the Hall of Fame band, Alabama. I mean, what more do you, that, that, that's, <laughs> what, you know. It's their backing band members. Um, and it was just amazing at the Texas Troubadour Theater. Mm -hmm. I had a song up for an award and I performed the first song I was going to release as a single called Listen to the Corn Grow. Go listen to it because it's the masculine house that built me. It's just a uh, 100% picturesque. You close your eyes, you can see yourself doing everything that I'm talking about in the song. It's a totally 100% truthful song and it's a repetitive event. Mm -hmm. I go back to this very same spot on planet Earth where I was born and raised and I sit in the very same place I did as a child underneath the very same tree on the same rock. The only thing that's different is it's not a cornfield anymore, it's a golf course. Nice. But I can still hear the corn grow. So I wrote a song and we performed it at the Texas Troubadour Theater in Nashville, Tennessee. And the guys just did an amazing job with me and girl, because the fiddle player for Alabama is, is a woman, Megan. And uh, yeah, it was an un it was an awesome moment. I can I can t I can believe it. Um, by the way, I'm gonna have links down in the description to all his social media so you can track down like where you know where he's gonna be and also uh, hear his music and, and you know buy his music. Uh, including your official website, yes. which is russlacast.com. Bing. Or bing. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, we're almost done. I wanted to uh, move on to question of gear. Now, you're not a drummer, so this will take an hour. <laughs> but what do you? what is that uh, guitar you play at a show? And do you, you don't bring any pedals, right? You just plug in direct? I plug direct. Not even a tuning yep. pedal or nothing? Nope. It's, uh, it's a Martin. Oh, good brand. Yes. Uh... CPA5 mm. and it has Fishman electronics in it. I haven't heard of them. And on your tone knob, because we all turn our tone down sure, we off do. when we play, um, because the, the sound engineer should be able to pick that up. Yeah. And, and then you have your volume knob. Your volume knob is for volume, or if you hold it down, it's your tuner. But on the tone knob, if you click it, it gives you different treble hmm. sounds. So I always click it four times, so you it's fancy. a little deeper. All right. And I, I just love 
when my music is now, played. Now, are, are you particular about strings, or do you, do you use a pick, or is it all finger picking? I use a pick. And are you particular about your picks? Absolutely. Here you go, guitarist in his pocket. Absolutely. I have to carry one because I'm about the only person that uses these absolutely See? light picks. You were wrong. I have a couple of .060s. Strings. The Junior Dunlops. Or yeah. not Junior, but Jim Dunlops. Yeah. Yep, Jim Dunlops. I have at least one of those. Yep. It may not be Dunlop, but, it, but I recognize yep. the, the feel the is there. Feel. I, I have to do that because... It always reminded me of playing with a library card. <laughs> Which... If you're in a pinch and need a pick, grab grab out a card, like a credit card or a library card. And and my wife actually one year gave me these. They they were like credit card shape, and they had a bunch of uh, pick guitar right. picks. They, comp they, cards. There you go. There you go. I use my comp cards. Because they're just this. flexible enough. Yeah. But not as flexible as that Dunlop pick. Yeah. Um, and for strings. Strings elixirs. Good choice. Yeah. Uh, who makes them? I'm blanking. Is Elixir the brand? Elixir is the brand. Elixir is the brand. Okay, cool. Elixir is the brand. You're 9 gauge, 10 gauge? Where are you right now? Uh, I believe 12. Why? You don't, you're you not playing power metal, dude. I, what? Want. <laughs> <laughs> I want those calluses. <laughs> Suffer from my heart. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, that's what I use. Because... <laughs> um, all you gotta do is just let your strings get dead, and then they'll be t oh yeah, like yeah. like mine. Mine are nice and dead. I need to change them up and dirty. The last time I had a band here, it was like, oh well, we we could perform. We just we didn't think about bringing a gear. And I'm like, well, here's my you know Ibanez cutaway that I haven't changed strings on in years, and you can hear I can hear it. And I'm like, mm, I'm sorry, <laughs> but you should have brought your own. Right. One night I was on stage, and there was a gentleman from Kentucky <clears throat> sitting next to me mm -hmm. and I was playing a song and when it got to the instrumental part the the eight bars right I leaned back and I go I'd watch your face if I was you and he's like I can hear it <laughs> we were playing and it lasted that song then it came back around where I was playing my last song mm -hmm. and just as I lifted up my guitar to take my strap off. Oh no. Kaping! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is always like every guitarist knows this fear. Of... <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh man. Yeah. He, uh, he could hear it. I could hear it. And uh, we just kept going. You got lucky is what you got. Yeah. All right. Uh, last question. You made it. Yay. Yes. Let's pretend we're talking to little Russ. <laughs> A question I like to ask at the end of every interview. Because I'm not going to say, like, what do you wish you'd done different or anything like that. I'm going to say, what do you wish someone had told you when you first started about make, thinking about making music? Now, for you, it's a little different. You never had that, I want to do that moment. It was more of, ah, yeah, it just it happened. It happened. Yes. But when you started actually thinking about songwriting and, and, and trying to, you know, put out pro uh, product, for lack of a better word, put out your music, what do you wish somebody had told you about, you know, doing music? Before you started doing it. This is for the new musicians in the crowd. New musicians. Well, to give you background on my life, my dad was very musical. He was could play ten different instruments. Oh, wow. Wonderful. When I was a little kid, I did go and say, I want to learn how to play the guitar. My dad looked me in the eye and said, I can't help you with the guitar because it's a chordal instrument. Why don't you learn how to play the saxophone or the flute or the clarinet and that way there you understand more about music well, it was a wind and, instrument first and melodies yes yeah but he also could play the organ the piano you know so reading music the two different staffs i mean i can't read bass staff i i don't even know what it is right. um but eventually not listening to him kind of caused me years and years and years of not ever being able to do it. And then when I always had a guitar, I still have this, an electric guitar I had when I was a child. Mm -hmm. It's a full size uh, Tiesco. A Tesco? Uh, yeah, 440, yeah. Or uh, Tiesco. Tiesco. Wait, Tiesco. It is T-E-S. P E I S C O. Yes, Tysco. Or Tysco. No, I used I used to have one, and I 
loved that thing and I left it in the parking lot of a Hooters casino after a battle of the bands. Oh. And I got home and I was like, I really just did that. And it's gone. I thought I found a replacement online. I didn't pay attention to the specs. And it was a short oh, version. Sure. It looks kind of like it. But yes, Tysco. Very... I, w I wish... I, yep. Oh, I wish I had it. Anyway. I had the four pickup one. Anybody who's watched any of my early interviews back in the day know, has heard my lament about this guitar and how beautiful yeah. I loved it. But uh, anyway, you were saying, you had a Tysco. You so still have I still have that. And um, the very first acoustic guitar was a Martin Goya. I bought with my $2 a week allowance when I was in junior high school. And, and I still have that. And I had it when my last woman left me and I said, well, I'm going to learn how to play. And then I bought a cheap one off QVC, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, I, I learned to play on that. And then when I moved to New England, I bought the Martin, mm -hmm. uh, because I knew I wanted to elevate my career. So if I was to tell myself something, one is if someone's willing to teach you music, even though it's way above your head or you think it's way above your head, mm -hmm. learn. The music theory. The do, music theory. Do the music theory. Do the music Don't theory. Don't yeah. I should have learned it from my father, and I didn't. And uh, he has never heard me play because he passed away in 2011. Uh, but he knew how musical I was because I'd always buy record albums. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I right. still have a collection. And uh, don't give up. And a lot of people would tell you poetry is not lyrics, but poetry can become lyrics. It would be wrong. Because you can elongate your thoughts and dress them up, give them what we call furniture. Ask Jim Morrison. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he was a poet. Yeah. He was a poet first, and then Ray Manzara yeah. was like, hey, man, these would make really good lyrics. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, uh, Bernie Taupin, too. I yep, yeah, Bernie Taupin. I mean, and, and then, you know, things are changing. It, it can always, you, your lyrics will always change with, with um, the melody and the instrumentation that you hear. And I would have done all this sooner. Yeah, and same thing for me. Like, I wish I had the drive that I do now when I was willing to sleep in my car. You know, when I was <laughs> younger and dumber. Yeah. And, you know. But I was like, you know, it's... As long as you're doing something towards whatever it is yeah. that you're passionate about, you're winning. You're yes. doing the thing. Yeah. And and as long as you know, as long as every once in a while, just make yourself uncomfortable and push your boundaries. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to grow. If if you just are like, no, I know these three chords, and I'm happy with these three chords. All right, fine. Yeah. Join a punk band, and yeah. you'll be you know fine. Go for it. Yeah. But you know, there's other music out there. And a lot of my problem was. If you knew me as a child, mm -hmm. I was way more introverted than I am now. See, right now I kind of feel outgoing because I've had these past few years experience of playing out and interacting. And when I first moved to Nashville, I was called, there was a word, I can't remember what it was, but socially awkward. Ah, You're a socially awkward gentleman. Well, yeah, because... I'm so, I was so shy mm -hmm. when I first moved to Nashville. It was a big city, basically. I, 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 it's like, I'd be shaking. I, I was shaking everywhere. I was afraid to approach people to tell them I enjoyed their music. And, yep. you know, if, if you don't have that introvertness, do it. I mean, go, go out there and, and, and do it. And if you are an introvert, you can get out of that. Because I wish I would have not been so much of an introvert. Mm -hmm. And I could have done it sooner. And I really wish I could. Right on. But now, I'm here. And I figure I got another 30 years of good living. And, uh, <laughs> or we'll 40. See. Right on. And... Uh, Playing here in Vegas, I I never thought I'd ever see a Vegas stage, let alone a Nashville stage, and playing in public, I never thought that either until I got to Nashville. And Nashville, um, every venue has music. Um, it's not a place to go to be paid, 
because it's it's a place to go develop in and yeah. also work with people who will become yep. and network and yeah network that's what and I hear network with these people um, I know a lot of Vegas musicians actually who had they go to Nashville to record yes and to work with do. actual producers yep and then they but they live here because they know like here recording here is different mm -hmm. the, the the culture is not as strong here um, there's a lot of great studios a lot of great engineers and producers but nashville's nashville yeah just like you know austin is austin yes. you know so and my two eps were both recorded in nashville at prime cup studio by uh mr daniel dennis which i cannot thank him enough shut up and oh man he 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 brought me up, and he's a younger man. Um, Dad has twins. I believe they're almost four years old now, and and he's just amazing, and he would learn things about me as to what to say to get me like to a happier point. Because if you look at a lot of stuff that I play, I'm like, when I stop playing, I'm like, frowning right. but it's because i'm thinking about the song and i don't want to mess it up but he would get on the intercom and go give me your sexy voice <laughs> or something and, and make me laugh and it would bring me lighter or he would do that phase pedal that with the guitar like, or something like the thx sound at the beginning of a movie yeah <laughs> and it's like Whoa, and then the wheels will start turning, even though I wrote the song one way, it's like oh good, I'm gonna sing it this a way. Good engineer or producer <laughs> is always saying but what if? You yeah. know, now try it this way, and you're always like, but that's not Yeah, actually. Yeah, so yeah. Well, hey, I wanna thank you for watching. Yes. Thank Russ for coming by, and we are gonna actually have a music video from him where he plays with the backing band for Alabama. What is the name of that song again? Listen to the corn grow. Let's do the corn grow. So I'll have a link down there for the video itself, but just stick around because it's going to be tacked on at the end of this. In the meantime, if you want to be on the channel, whether reviewed, interviewed, or both, hit me up. I got a social media link down below. It's also where you can support the channel by either becoming a patron on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. I've got some patron only content. Uh, buy some merch at room six. I got a nice line here that says, make music, not excuses. But you I turn thought we turned that You turned it off. You said, here, try that button. Frickin' iPhones. <laughs> In the meantime, <clears throat> if you want to see more videos like this, please click up there. If you'd like to subscribe, I really do appreciate it. Please, it does help the channel. Please click down there and don't forget to ring the bell, like and share. Remember to be amazing. And we'll see you next time on Room 6. Say goodbye. Bye. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba. Hey, there we go. This dusty tracker path Run on the stone wall Through the knee-high grass By that old farmhouse Grandpa Bill Kitts A wet flower garden Has that smell Of a fresh old lawn It's where I grew up And on the edge of the field I'll bark by that sign At Clark Road Six one nine and I come here from time to time and I get lost inside it may sound strange to you I know I can't explain what calls me home but it's the only place that I can go with you
Yeah, the corn. Cool. 